Hello friends, welcome to Be Waste Wise. I am Shweta Bandapani. I am the community builder at Be Waste Wise. What we do at Be Waste Wise is we try to make knowledge accessible to people all across the world. And uh, we have been conducting webinars since 2013. And since last year, we have been doing two webinars a month with moderators from different parts of the world. And today we have Kat Heinrich, who is the director at Rotec and who is moderating today's webinar. And Kat has been moderating webinars for us since uh, two years now. She, along with Heise Langevold, who's another moderator, both of them run this blog called Beyond Food Waste. They're very passionate about issues relating to food waste. And uh, if you haven't seen any of their earlier webinars, please head to the video panel section of our website. You will have access to them. Please have a look at those websites. Have a look at those webinars. Now, I'm sorry, I'm a little off today because I'm feeling slightly sick. And uh, Kat is going to talk to Bethany Fitzpatrick, who's a national operations lead at Oz Harvest. They're both going to talk about food rescue and uh, responding to a global pandemic and beyond. And we have received your questions. We pass them on to both Kat and Bethany. If you have any more questions, please feel free to use the Q&A section. They will be pick, uh, Kat will be picking up questions from the Q&A section and you will get your responses. So over to you, Kat. Thank you very much for the introduction, Suitha. Uh, so no, it's my absolute pleasure um, to interview Bethany Fitzpatrick today from Oz Harvest about food rescue, which is a really important topic when we're talking about reducing food waste, but also really important from the perspective of redistributing that food and giving it to people in need. And never before have we been at a time uh, where that need is so great during this pandemic. It's, it's created more challenges um, for the types of activities that Ozharpers do, but also rising to that challenge. Uh, so shortly I'll be introducing Bethany, but as Sweeka said, I'd like to talk about food rescue, what role it plays in the food waste challenge um, and responding to COVID, but also looking forward and what does the future of food rescue look like? So, um, yeah, it's my great pleasure to introduce Bethany. Welcome. Thanks, Kat. Thank you so much for having me. Fantastic. So, um, Bethany, we have an international audience with us today, people from the US, Europe and um, uh, Southeast Asia tuning in. So for those who aren't aware, oh, someone just said hello from Myanmar. Hello. hello. <laughs> Lisbon, Portugal. <laughs> Lisbon, Portugal. It's like 4.30 a.m. there. <laughs> That's impressive. Um, so, yeah, just to start with, um, can you tell us a little bit about Oz Harvest and your role there? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Oz Harvest is, is, as you said, we're a food rescue organisation and, and that means that we collect quality surplus food from a range of different donors and we redistribute it to people in need. So we work with different agencies and charities to redistribute that food. We were founded in 2004 by our, our CEO and founder, Ronnie Khan, who actually at the time was running an events company um, and it was corporate events. And, and she just noticed that there was huge amounts of food going to waste. And at the same time, she saw that there was a huge community need and she started just delivering that food to charities. And that's really how we started. Um, once she had sort of secured herself a van, she, she was delivering about 4,000 meals a month. And that was sort of 16 years ago. So now we've really grown. We're, we're a national organisation now. We service over 1,300 charities nationally um, and we have delivered about 160 million meals now. Um, and, and we're not just food rescue as an organisation. We've got a couple of other areas that we do work in. So we sort of have four main pillars. We've got food rescue and more recently food relief, which is all about getting food to people who, who need it. We've got our education pillar, so we run three different education programs. So that's NEST, which goes into the agencies and the charities that we work with, FEAST, which uh, goes into primary schools and high, more recently this year, high schools, um, and Nourish, which works with at-risk youth to provide uh, hospitality training and employment pathways for them. So our education programs are really all based around community capacity building and, and teaching those sort of life skills of cooking and nutrition and all about food waste. Um, and then we've got our sustainability work that we do. Um, so that includes our fight food waste programs and campaign as well as our advocacy work that 
we do with government. So that sort of informs policy on reducing food waste, but also the work that we do on behalf of food insecure Australians. Um, and our fourth pillar is innovation. So innovations are things like our uh, For Purpose Co, which is a sustainable and socially focused uh, profit generating business, which does then support Oz Harvest. Um, and they focus on, on food waste prevention and, and technology. So for example, we have our Juice for Good vending machines, which use uh, blemished oranges, um, which would otherwise go to waste in, in vending machines um, around Sydney. So that's just an example of, of that. So we are a food rescue organisation, um, but there are a lot of other activities going on. And uh, as for my own role, I, I work in the national operations team. So um, I sit across sort of food waste and food relief strategy predominantly. Oh, thanks, Bethany. So that's quite a lot of activities you're doing at the moment. As you said, it was, was it 16 years ago or something that Oz Harvest was started. So that's obviously right. there's been quite a big journey there to get to that point where you were able to um, create such an impact um, on food waste and, and food relief. Um, and it probably comes as a bit of a surprise to a lot of people listening today um, to hear that Australia even has this need because we are a rich country, definitely. And um, yeah, it's kind of, I remember when I first heard about the scope of, of food, the need for food rescue and food relief in Australia, I was quite surprised. So um, Bethany, can you kind of share some statistics about you know, how much, how many people are facing food insecurity in Australia? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we know actually globally that we do produce enough food to feed everyone, but globally there's about 800 million people that go hungry, uh, which is about one in nine people. But if we look closer to home, there are over 5 million people in Australia that experience food insecurity and a quarter of those people are children. Um, so, and, and we do know that obviously since COVID hit, since we've been in the pandemic, those figures are even greater. Three in 10 Australians who are experiencing food insecurity now hadn't gone hungry before the pandemic. And, you know, we know from speaking to our charities that they have seen an increase in people seeking their help to access food. And, you know, this is predominantly um, in casual workforces. Obviously, we saw it in our international students, temporary visa holders who didn't necessarily receive government support. But the increase is certainly across the board. Um, and yeah, I, I agree with you. I think a lot of people would be really, really surprised to hear those statistics in a country like Australia, but there is certainly a very significant need. And I just, it is shocking, but it's also, yeah, very, very um, good to hear that Oz Harvest is stepping up and, and other charities as well, food relief charities across Australia to bridge that gap. Um, when it comes to food waste, because you're, you're rescuing food, I understand, that, and that's part of the food that you provide and food relief activities, what, what kind of um, organisations do you drive those vans out to, to collect the food from? Yeah, so we um, could could be delivering to, to any kind of charity. So two charities and, and, and our model is built on the idea that the food is free. So everything we do deliver is always free and, and then those charities then also pass that food on for free. Um, but it could be anything. So it, it could be schools in low socioeconomic areas. It could be uh, Salvos or, or Vinnies or it could be... Uh, community groups, church groups, uh, lots of refuges, uh, lots of services um, for people experiencing homelessness. Um, so a lot of different kind of models of services out there, but always charity. So our, our model um, is really a, a business to charity model. And then the charities then do that individual direct food relief. Right, so you're the logistics person in the middle or organisation in the middle connecting businesses that have food waste and, and, and those charities that look after people in need. So the yep. businesses that you collect the food waste from, is that, that restaurants and, and supermarkets? Is that is right? Is there any yep. other organisation that you Absolutely. Collect? So uh, about 60% of our donations do come from supermarkets. Uh, but we do collect, obviously, from restaurants, from events, uh, from airlines, from um, 
all sorts of different different places only from retailers so so we don't collect from individuals it is from a retail model um, but we have a really really wide ranging set of donors really yeah and 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 how have like the journey because i'm just thinking about people listening in today who might not be at the same place as old harvest but still either at the starting point of starting the food rescue organization and you know what what has underpinned Oz Harvest's success over the the years and getting to the point of this today how have you um, managed to to get to that point yeah absolutely so I think that there's a couple of things there I think uh, there's both our sort of operating model and then there's also the Oz Harvest brand and, and both of those things are a really big part of our success so if we Talk about the brand first, um, you know, obviously maybe some people listening today might not know Ronnie, our CEO and founder, but she's, um, if you're in Australia, you probably have heard from of her if you're listening to this podcast, this webinar. Um, you know, Ronnie has an amazing ability to really storytell. She has an amazing ability to connect people and convince people that the cause that she's passionate about is something they should also be passionate about. And that was really, really vital in the early stages of building, building the organisation when, when no one else was doing what she was doing and she really needed to sort of take people on a journey. And that sort of carried through to how we've built the brand now 16 years on. It's a really recognisable brand I and mean, obviously it's, it's bright yellow and everyone knows our symbols, but it's, it's not just that, it's really, I think the value that underpins it. So our core value is, you know, nourish our country and we kind of try and, you know, show that within all of the work that we do. So we're not just couriers, we don't just collect and deliver food. There's a really big piece about building relationships and building community and building connection um, to the cause there, which I think is really important because it's not just branding, but that comes sort of down from the very top through the staff to our drivers who are really our biggest brand ambassadors. They then take that feeling to our food donors and when our food and donors are engaged with the cause and engaged with where that food is going, that helps us get a really high consistency and high quality of food, which in turn, you know, then gives our agencies and our charities, you know, that consistency and they know that they can rely on us for, for high quality donations. So it sort of all stems from that same place. And I think the other, the other part that we do with the brand is really try and tell stories. So we do a lot of work where we're trying to, you know, show sort of real time stories, whether or not that's you know, the drivers taking photos when they're out on the road and things like that, but being able to connect the people who support us and who are donating or who are partners or who they might have donated meals and show them exactly where that donation has gone and ended up and, and the real life story behind it, I think is really important to building successful partnerships and, and successful sort of donors. Um, and, you know, we do things like that as well through our, for example, our CEO cook-off, which is our flagship fundraiser. It's a little bit different to normal fundraisers, um, but it really gives people a chance to connect with not only the work that we do, but the people that we serve. And, and so a big part of our brand is building human sort of connection, which, which I think really goes a, a long way to gaining that community support and, and, the, and the support of partners that we really rely on. So the brand is one piece and then the other piece of the success is, is the operational model that we have. So all of the food rescue organisations, well, really in Australia anyway, um, we all operate a little bit differently. We all have slightly different logistics and work in a slightly different space. At Oz Harvest, we are focused really on, on very high value food, but that often has a slightly lower yield than, for an example, uh, a food bank, which can collect really, really, really big bulk donations. That's not where we sit. We have our yellow van model, which is a little bit smaller, but those high value foods are things like fruit and, fruit and veg, so produce, um, cooked meals, 
food that comes from restaurants, food that comes from bakeries or events that's very high in nutritional value. Um, and that's the, the things that our agencies really like and need. So we've been able to sort of build that consistency and reliability for the agencies. And, you know, a big part of being able to do that is the yellow van model. So having the smaller vans means that we're more agile, which means we can access supermarket loading docks, which is really important. You know, as I said earlier, 60% of our donations come from supermarkets. So our relationship with those major supermarkets is absolutely key. And then the other part of the way that we, we run those logistics is our, our logistics software and our data management capabilities. So the system is quite scalable, which is really good for us. So we can scale easily and it can track the food uh, in quite a lot of detail. So what we're collecting and what we're delivering, which um, means because we are sort of operate in such an ad hoc environment, not only are we able to give out donors um, and agencies this sort of the level of consistency of service, but it also means that we can give our donors and partners also really important statistics about our impact. So, you know, obviously then that goes back to the branding piece of we're doing what we're doing, but we need to be able to talk about it and we need to be able to have the statistics to show what we're doing as well. So that's been a really key part of being able to uh, speak to our success and sort of demonstrate our success, which obviously goes to, to building more um, support. And then I think also the sort of final thing on that is, is going back to that pillar of innovation. So we were talking earlier about not just being a food rescue organisation. We've got a lot of different touch points. You know, we've got different events like the CEO Cook-Off, which is a completely different model to any other fundraising event sort of that happens we've got our education programs. So there's three different areas there that we're able to go into the community and make an impact. Um, we have things like, you know, when we opened our supermarket in Kensington, which, op which operates on a model of take what you need, give if you can, you know, that was the world's first free supermarket of that kind. So we uh, do a lot of work um, looking at problems and thinking how can we creatively tackle these different problems and what are the different solutions that that we can bring here and I think that sort of concept of innovation and, and being a little bit more agile in what we do and, and being open to trying things um, has really gone a long way to sort of expanding the impact that we've been able to have. Excellent and um we have a question coming in just right now from Isabel, um, one of the audience here. Um, just on that, you know, that model that you have, her question is, how do you finance yourself? Yeah, absolutely. So pre-COVID, we had a slightly different model to what we have now. We had only about 3% government funding. Um, and so finance came from um, major corporate partners, um, just everyday regular givers, um, philanthropy, a lot of grants. So a lot of our education programs are funded by different grants. And then we also obviously have our, have our fundraising campaigns, so our CEO cook-off, which is our, our big fundraiser of the year, as well as we have different campaigns throughout the, the year and, and a lot of community support as well. Um, and we have things like our cooking for a cause classes, for example, which is, is, is a fundraising revenue stream for us. So corporate engagement activities and things like that. Whereas now uh, post COVID, we obviously during COVID, we haven't been able to have those activities, those fundraising activities, corporate engagement, the CEO cook off, those sorts of things. So our, our funding has shifted a little bit so we've seen an, an increase in government funding as government has sort of obviously stepped up and realised, well, this is going to be a crisis. You know, we need to we need to help. And, and so that's changed our model a little bit, but predominantly private and, and, and public donors. OK. And, yeah, nice segue into COVID. So you mentioned that your funding models changed. So take us back a year ago or more um, when... 
COVID started, you know, Australia started noticing that COVID was happening. I know it started earlier in, in China than that. Um, how, what were the early signs for, for you at Oz Harvest and how did you start to respond to that? How did it affect you? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, it, you know, it really affected the business model in, in a lot of different ways because we had so many different things happening. I think the, the real early signs were we were two weeks away from delivering our CEO cook-off that year. So we were uh, in, in very much event planning mode. Um, and uh, I think we had decided we would postpone the event the day before the Australian government had came out and said all events are cancelled. So that was sort of one of the first really big impacts to the business. But obviously very, very quickly following that, we saw some really big impacts to the rest of the business and food rescue in particular. So um, we, you know, we saw obviously in Australia, there was a lot of panic buying at that time when Australia went into lockdowns. Um, and, and when there's panic buying in the supermarkets and there's no food on supermarket shelves, that obviously means there's also no food to donate to organisations like ours. Um, and so that was a really challenging environment for us nationally. It was a really interesting time, though. It was very volatile because while we saw our food rescue from, from supermarkets really, really drop, we also saw a real surge in ad hoc jobs you know, from, from restaurants that had closed, from, from events that had cancelled, from lots of corporate offices who, you know, had kitchens who, who feed the staff, but all of a sudden their entire workforce was working from home. So we had a lot of ad hoc jobs then. And then we, um, following that was sort of the producers and the suppliers who would be selling onto those restaurants who all of a sudden they didn't have their customers. It was really volatile time of trying to balance that and it, it did take you know, probably about six weeks to two months to sort of stabilize um so at the same time as that was sort of happening there was a lot of changing sort of things in the charity space as well so obviously a lot of the charities were also impacted by the different restrictions that were put on some some of them closed about 30 percent of them either closed or suspended their operations and that was uh, often due to either a, a lack of volunteers or perhaps their operating model wasn't really compatible with the restrictions. So they might have operated a model where they did a nightly dinner service or something similar and they, they couldn't then do that. But at the same time, there was, um, you know, a lot of new, new charities were popping up because there was all of a sudden this huge need. So it was really sort of different trying to balance who was closing, who was opening, where was the need, you know, and, and we saw here that there was, you know, all of a sudden this huge need of groups of people who had probably previously never needed food relief before. So a lot of people who didn't necessarily know where to access food relief and had, had never had to do so. Um, so we sort of really had to think very, very quickly as to how would we uh, firstly support those people and, and how do we, how do we um, provide support that's accessible to them because there were these new demographics, so that casual workforce that we were talking about um, earlier and, and international <laughs> students. So um, we had to really, really think about how we were going to operate our business and, and what needed to be done at the time. Um, you know, thankfully we did get a, a, get a lot of government support when governments realised, well, this is going to be a crisis. There's, there's a lot of people out of work. And we really used that to pivot into new, new ways of working. And we started rolling out rapid emergency food relief programs across the country. So that included things like camper hubs, different food hubs, targeted at different demographics, you know, working with, for example, working with universities to make sure we could get food to international students, um, different cooked meals programs where we were working with um, hospitality companies who, who you know, were, were closed and so they called and said, can we cook meals for you and with you? Um, so the new programs like that, we 
um, have, a, have a, a new mobile market that travels regional New South Wales to deliver food relief. We opened a second free supermarket in Sydney. Um, you know, we had a new, we've started a new food delivery, meals delivery uh, offering called Harvest Bites, which is was sort of born out of the need to replace our um, fundraising revenue streams. So we had a huge amount of, of movement in the company, a lot of staff redeployments, a lot of people acting in new roles and, and a lot of work that had to be done to sort of rebuild then what was going to be the structure and the reporting and the data management and all of a sudden having all of these new programs operating at the same time and, and just an unbelievable amount of food going out to support these different communities. So um, we, we really changed our model and probably the biggest thing out of all of that is that now uh, having come through the, the most sort of intense emergency time of that, we've really actually changed our strategic priorities to include food relief programs alongside our food rescue operations uh, as one of our priorities moving forward because we know that the need is not going away. Mm. Well, sounds like a, a very challenging time for Oz Harvest to respond and it, it is a big credit to the organisation, you, you, your team, your ability to be so agile and, and respond to the, the changing sources of food, the changing need for food and, and being able to respond. Do you think there's any long-term impacts in terms of how the government views uh, charities like Oz Harvest from COVID? Yeah, look, I, I would hope so. I mean, I, I think that what we've seen in the last year and, and not just with the work that we've done, but what we saw, I think, across the entire sector was and a really amazing amount of collaboration. All of a sudden, there were food security groups set up with all of the, you know, organisations that provide food relief in, in particular areas. So in every state in Australia had one. Um, you know, we saw government facilitate the, those connections and, and really sort of lead in saying, okay, well, we'll just, we know here are the problem, who can help, how can you all help each other? And so that was really, really key. And I think that we've also proven that, you know, without organisations like ours, we are, you know, obviously we've always been deemed an essential service throughout COVID. So, you know, we, we of course kept working, but, you know, really demonstrated how essential that service really is. And, and I think that it really sort of, highlights the need to support organisations like ours and other organisations that are doing food rescue and food relief services because it's a service that that the, the government isn't equipped to provide but but we are so I think it's that really key piece of collaboration that needs to sort of cut that's the lesson that comes from this year. We have a, a question that came in um before the session and the lead up to this one, asking about managing food safety. Now, obviously with everything changing, you know, you've got to have some really good practices in place to make sure that whatever food that you're rescuing, that it's safe to eat. So can you take us through some of those processes and, and standards that you have, Bethany? Yeah, of course. So on an industry level, the way that food donation works is that the food donors are responsible for ensuring that the food is safe to eat um, and, and safe to be given away when it is donated. Uh, our responsibility, of course, is that we then we then have responsibility to collect that food and and handle it in in a food safe way while we while we deliver it. So. Food safety is absolutely key to our business. It's, it's an extremely important part of what we do. We deliver to uh, fairly vulnerable communities. So it is very important to us. And, and it's obviously something we take very seriously. But in terms of parameters, I mean, I, I won't go into all of, of the food safety details, but obviously all of our drivers that are, are well trained and well versed in what we can and can't pick up we do you know have some things that we we can't pick up for example uh, really high risk foods like shellfish or cooked rice um, and obviously anything past its use by date we wouldn't collect um, 
you know, our vans are all refrigerated, you know, and, and, and we really understanding of the need for the continuance of, of the cold chain in the food supply. So, you know, always in a refrigerated van. I mean, there's a, a lot of, of different aspects to it, which, you know, I, I, I won't say them all now, but certainly that it, food safety is a, a really big part of, of what we do. But I would also sort of say that generally all of the food that we do get donated is, is fit for consumption. Um, we give our donors really, really strict guidelines when they, when they call and say, I've, I've got something to donate. You know, they, they get guidelines around you know, the way that food needs to be prepared and handled. And as I mentioned earlier, we don't collect from individuals. So we just from, from retailers. Uh, which is also a, a big food safety safety aspect, um, but you know we would we would never collect or deliver anything that we didn't think was safe for consumption. Mm. And uh, one of the main customers or um, donors, I should say, that you collect from, which you mentioned earlier, is supermarkets. Through, through my work, we've uh, been helping a lot of supermarkets looking at strategies to reduce their waste. And, and it's interesting that I still see a lot of food waste going to landfill in these environments. So I'm curious, Bethany, for your perspectives on, you know, and, and, and this can be within the same brand of supermarket, if you like. There can be one, um, you know, supermarket chain that has very different uh, food rescue outcomes from one store to the next. So do you, just based on your observations, so there, what, what, why do some supermarkets, why are they able to get their staff to source separate and, and set aside the food waste um, better than others? Why are some more successful at food rescue than others? Yeah, look, that's a really good question. And we work very, very closely with our supermarket partners on this, um, you know, constantly. Um, and I think the important thing is, is that it, it can't just be, something that is top that comes from the top it, it really needs to be at all levels in in the supermarket and and along that chain so you know it's it's fantastic that we have supermarkets sort of say this is what we're going to do and and we've decided to support this and this is our policy and that is so important and and absolutely vital but we also need every staff member in that supermarket to be engaged in the process and to be uh, thinking about it and, and on top of it and um, really being able to come forward to help with the, the quality and the consistency and the management of, of how that's sort of how the food rescue piece works on, a, on an operational level. But it also comes down to different policies and understanding how different policies will then affect um, you know what can and, and can't be rescued. So I, I think it's it's a, a lot of it is really an engagement and education piece. And obviously, there's so many people involved in that in that different process um, that it's it's um, sometimes I guess a, a challenge to try and get everybody sort of thinking and 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 working to the same the same sort of outcome that we all want yeah it's interesting you mentioned before the power of taking people on a van to see firsthand the the issue and, and what where the food gets donated i wonder if that's a, a strategy for supermarkets to get some of their key staff you know working fruit and veg department or the you know behind the the butcher area or whatever those those that the managers if you like making the decisions and um keep getting them on a, a odds harvest van or something similar to to actually influence um, them and, and then help them see the, the value in doing it because without that, you know, you can have management above um, doing the right things and, and wanting to make sure the food gets rescued. But at the end of the day, it comes down to the staff who are working the shift as to whether they can be bothered um, putting aside the food and, and whether they see that as a valuable activity to do. I've um, got another question here um, from, sorry, Gaudi. I don't know how to pronounce your name, sorry. Um, what percentage of inevitable food losses do you encounter in your own chain and do you compost it? So I assume that, you know, you, you do your best to rescue the food and, and send it to people in need, but there's, at the end of the day, there's some still some wastage, some food that doesn't quite get there in time. Um, how, what percentage is that and, and what do you do with that food waste? 
Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I, and I wouldn't say that, that those food losses are really in our chain because we wouldn't collect something that we couldn't deliver. So if our drivers go to a supermarket loading dock and there's food there that is for whatever reason, uh, and, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a supermarket loading dock, it could be any, any collection if it was contaminated or they felt that for whatever reason it was compromised, we just wouldn't collect it. So uh, we don't really compost a lot of food because we don't collect it in the first place. We really try and work in the space of prevention rather than treatment of waste. Of course, we have composting here at Oz Harvest and when we do have organics, I mean, it does happen that for whatever reason, sometimes, um, you know, I mean, we, we have commercial kitchens here. So of course we have organic waste um, that, that waste does get picked up and it is commercially composted, but really a very, very minor percent. In fact, it's very, very rare that food that we would have collected for food rescue would then go into the compost because we just wouldn't collect it if it wasn't fit for consumption. Yeah, okay. Um, and I've got another question here that was posted um, before the session by one of the people who registered. What are the highest priority program strategies that governments can implement to reduce food waste and what are the most effective policies? Yeah, absolutely. It's a really good question and it's definitely something that we're talking about now in, in our sector here in Australia and, and the biggest one is absolutely lobbying governments to regulate and uh, regulate food waste and things like you know, tax incentivization, um, and that could be in the form of um, incentives for making donations, or it could be uh, charging food waste that goes to landfill, the two sort of different ways of doing it. But absolutely, regulation is um, one of the key things because we know that once it comes down to um, a, a financial benefit, that we will see more success in this space. It's a little bit um, the, the hearts and minds and taking people on the journey is absolutely important, but we know that a big part of this is regulation. So I think governments regulating the, the food waste is one big thing. I also, you know, other things that they can be doing is, is supporting organizations like us so so providing grants to organizations that do provide food rescue services uh, building those networks and and helping support industry and building uh, providing resources for organizations like ours really important and then the third thing that they can absolutely do in terms of food waste is provide uh, food waste and organic collections alongside their recycling and and landfill, um, you know, waste treatment that that in in Australia in particular, in, in New South Wales where I am, different councils do it completely differently. Some councils don't do it at all. Some councils do it really, really well. Um, but that would go a, a very long way to to combating the effects of food waste. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Bethany. Yeah, I agree with with your perspective there about the importance of legislation. And I've seen that through some of the previous webinars we've done, for example, with Massachusetts, uh, about the power of you know, preventing through legislation, free waste from ending up in landfill and how that then um, can have flow on effects to supporting food rescue charities to set up and, and then also providing that yeah, additional assistance through grants. So I think those two, um, uh, policy measures combined can really drive a change and, and even in France you would have heard about the ban that they have on supermarkets from throwing away their food waste um, that has certainly increased the amount of food rescue activities there so it is something I would also like to see in Australia um, implemented by the government obviously in, in the right way uh, but I think that could go a long way to, to further um, improving the, the amount of food that actually gets rescued rather than ends up in landfill. Um, yes, it's, it's an interesting one. So we've, we've talked a lot about the journey of Oz Harvest, how it's gotten to the point where it is today. And we've talked about the impacts of COVID. So I'm curious to now focus on what does the future of food rescue look like? I mean, 
how how have what kind of initiatives and innovations is Oz Harvest looking at going forward? Yeah, absolutely, and and that's a really good question. I mean, I think the future of food waste, I would go back to the idea of tax incentives, as I as I just mentioned, it's certainly something that we are lobbying for at the moment. And, and it will be a, a, a really big part of making change on on a on a significant level. So that's really one piece. Um, and you know, in terms of of Oz Harvest and, and the way that we are looking for, for innovations and you know, how to increase our efficiency. You know, we're looking for things, um, you know, innovation in, in technology predominantly, ways to be able to get better information to and from our donors so that we can sort of know exactly where the food is, a, a better way of communicating with them, um, you know, a better way of managing our data. So being able to really visualize not only where is the food, but also where is the need. And as a sector, also be able to share that data as well so that we can collaboratively sort of um, together, you know, look for different solutions. Um, and so data management is, is a really important one for us uh, that we're certainly looking at. You know, and then of course, really innovative food technology. So uh, things like For Purpose Co that I mentioned earlier, you know, they really work in that food waste technology space. Um, for example, they work with Winnow Solutions, which is a, a, a tech solution that sits in restaurants that, you know, is designed to reduce the food waste that comes out of a restaurant. You know, really innovative stuff uh, is things like that, you know, and, and I think as well, not necessarily something that Oz Harvest will be doing, but you know we'll see really big ad advances in uh, you know food valorization technologies. So that is taking food waste and turning it into another product. So for example, that might be if you're a, a manufacturing company you produce orange juice, what do you do with the orange peels? And it's turning those orange peels into you know another product that can be used. So. That's not necessarily somewhere where Oz Harvest will be, but it is certainly somewhere that will be sort of on the food waste landscape in future, which is really, really exciting. But, you know, all of these things are sort of helping us to try and, and, and achieve that, you know, UN a sustainable development goal of, of halving food waste by 2030. Yeah, and so it's interesting to hear you talking about the role that technology can play and, and so is it essentially the way you see it is technology will make it easier to identify where the free waste is and, and where the donors are and so making it more efficient and also raising awareness. So that's, is, is that in, this, in summary, is that how you kind of see Oz Harvest activities changing over the coming years through that technology? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I don't, uh, it, it's not necessarily that we'll, we'll be changing the activity that we'll, we will do. I mean, our, our yellow band model is certainly one that we will stick with, but, you know, we've had things like a, the trial of our food app, for example, um, and there's lots of different tech, different technologies similar that are also doing, you know, amazing jobs in connecting you know, businesses to consumers and consumers to consumers in food waste as well. Technology absolutely plays a part because anything that can make our business more efficient means that we can then collect more food. Yeah, interesting. And um, to finish up, Bethany, I'm just you know, there's a, as we mentioned at the start, there's a whole bunch of people from around the world listening in today, and, and some people might be looking at. Um, setting up a food rescue organisation um, or taking their existing organisation to that next level. So um, do you have any advice or relevant experiences you think other countries and cities um, that you would like to share to help them set up an effective food rescue system? Absolutely. Look, I think that if, if you're going to look at starting something like this, I think the really the most important place to start is by looking at the industry and seeing who else is doing it. So they might not be doing exactly this model, our model or, or the model that you wanna start, but absolutely look at who are the other players and what are they doing? And are there other ways that you could, instead of starting your own organization or starting you know, to reinvent the wheel, how can you work together to support work that 
is already happening because oftentimes you will find that it is already happening. And if it's not, then absolutely start it. But it's also making sure that you look around and have a look at, at the other side. So if it's a similar model to Oz Harvest, then you know who are the charities and, and what are the food relief services operating in the area and, and how can you work with them? Because the, the most important thing is sort of that consistency and, and building relationships that are long lasting. So that needs to happen on your food donor side, but also with your food charities. So, you know, being able to build a system that is going to be sustainable and a big part of that is collaboration. Thank you very much, Bethany. That's fantastic. And um, yeah, thank you all for our audience for listening in. I certainly learned a lot, Bethany, and it was interesting hearing your story about how COVID has impacted Oz Harvest operations and, and the future and, and what role governments can indeed play in, in that space and other organisations. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for the opportunity. It's been really great to come on and, and have a bit of a chat about what we're doing. Excellent. I'll pass back to Sweetha now. Thank you, Kat. Thank you, Bethany. Uh, Bethany, the last thought was really good, uh, the way you ended the entire conversation about how people need to look out for others who are already doing it, because that pretty much ends up being the crux of uh, food rescue in many ways. So thanks a lot for your time. And uh, thanks a lot to the attendees. I think some of you have attended it, though it's really early in the morning for you. And for the others who haven't attended, who've registered it, please, uh, once you watch the recorded version of it, Please write to us at connectedwastewise.be if you have any other questions. And uh, we will have more webinars with Cat and Heights later this year. So do sign up to our newsletter so you will have updates about <clears throat> the future webinars that we have scheduled. Thanks a lot. Have a good afternoon, good evening, both of you. Bye-bye. <laughs>